Ho ho and blow yo. Welcome to Pax Bomb 5. 5? Thinking of Steven Universe. Welcome to Pax Bomb 6. The last few chapters, the last chapters of, uh, of our beautiful book named Pax. Now, I was trying to find my ancient t-shirt, which I wore in the, in the first video, but then I realized uh, you guys won't see my t-shirt, really. So anyways, I have a Christmas tree, if you haven't already noticed. It's pretty pretty cute. Um, and yeah, let's get on to this, ladies and gentlemen. I'm excited. So we only have like 20 pages uh, to read, which ain't that bad, but you know, whatever. If you guys do want to see me read more books... Uh, remember to leave, drop a like, all that, and I uh, hope you guys enjoy this series finale of PAX. So let's do this. Chapter 29. Through my swelled PAX's belly, and a, and a muskrat dangled from his mouth. His first large, his first large prey. It would feed, bristle, and run for the whole day. He craved sleep after a long night of hunting, but as usual, he trotted a long, heaving path home to confuse any possible predators. The trail the bleeding runt had left when they'd moved was still strong enough to mark them as vulnerable. The first rays of morning light lit the grasses. A movement caught his eye, bristle. She was a f she was few full moment she was few full bounds out. In the clearing, instead of, of at the air at the apron of the burrow where she usually guarded Runt, he watched her bounce up in mock alarm and then tumble kicking into the grass. Then he saw an even more surprising sight: Runt's small head bobbed up. Runt was outside and he was playing. Pax dropped his the muskrat. He called to Bristle and Runt turned his head. Pax called again, testing, and Runt answered. He could hear. Pax was washed with a relief so overwhelming that he could not move for a moment. Where he had once cared for... Where he had once cared for only one boy, he now brimmed with his with love for this bristling vixen and her ragged brother, and they were safe. He streaked across the clearing. Bristle and Runt parted to welcome him, into the space between them. He dropped in onto his back and Runt toppled onto him. Pax rolled Runt over gently, listening for any whimper of pain, and heard only purrs of delight. For an hour, the foxes played. Runt rested often, and whenever he did, the other two foxes stopped and flanked him. Like the buttercups beside them, their three fox faces lifted to the morning sun. Until Bristle leaped to her feet, her nostrils flared. Pax smelled it too, the same threatening scent that had made him anxious for two days. But this was no longer a faint threat, threat in the air. This odor was strong and growing stronger. Coyote! Bristle jumped toward the den, pivoted toward the clearing, then jumped back to run. Pax had never seen, seen her so panicked. At that instant, all three foxes perked their ears sharply to the same spot in the woods, to the careless branch rust rustling of a creature that did not need the advantage of stealth. Heading north up from the gorge, heading for the clearing, the coyote was following Runch trail. Bristol nosed her brother upright and screamed at Pax, Guard him! Pax herded Run back into the den, pacing the, entra the entrance. He watched Bristol head toward the rustling, stiff led. Legged, legged and wary, and then stop. She pricked her ears, her rump high, and then in front of her, at the precise place where the junipers were, com were compressed from dragging run in, a jar, a dark, brindled coyote emerged. His head to the ground. Bristle barked. The coyote's head snapped up. Bristle barked again and jumped on and jumped into the clearing. The coyote cocked his head and took a step toward. Her. Then he lowered his nose to pat to Runt's trail. Deep inside, you know, deep instinct urged Pax to run away. The coyote was tall, heavily muscled male. A fox was no match for an animal that large and aggressive. But a deeper instinct reminded him that Runt was defenseless in the burrow. Bristle ignored the instinct to flee as well. Instead, she tore straight towards toward the coyote, lun 
lunging at his flank. The coyote spun and snapped, just clipping Bristle's back foot. She limped into the clearing, whining if she'd been injured. The coyote studied her, but then shook himself, recognizing the ploy, and dropped to the and dropped to the scent again. Bristle flew back. She jumped in front of the coyote's path and faced him. Her spine arced. From her throat came a hoarse howl Pax had never heard before. For an instant, the coyote pulled back, seeming surprised that the small fox was engaging him. Then he, then he bunched his shoulders into attack position and bared his teeth. Pax's body si stiffed. A growl rattled in his throat, runt whimpered in, in the den. The coyote sprang at Bristle and knocked her to the to the ground. For a moment, Pax saw nothing but fur and teeth flashing in the grass, and only her yips and growls. But then Bristle scrambled out of the coyote's hold. She leaped again towards the center of the clearing. A single leap only. Pax understood that she was luring him away from Runt, staying out of his reach. She baited the coyote until she reached the sweet gum tree. Then, just as Pax had done, she leaped up onto the slant of the trunk. She patted I went on to the low first branch carefully, never taking her eyes off the growling coyote who followed onto the ground. When she reached the spot where the branch split, she was well over his head. She hissed a taunt. The coyote jumped. He clawed only, only bark and leaves. He circled in the hollow under the branch, looking for higher ground, and then jumped again. This time his four paws caught the branch and held for an instant before he fell back. He got himself and leaped again. Pax saw that Bristle was far out on the limb as she could go. A coyote would tear her from the tree soon, or, gr or grow impatient with her distractions and return to the trail she diverted from him. Him from. She would follow and fight until she ripped her part up. Uh, until he ripped her apart. Stay, Pax ordered to run, and he tore across the clearing. So that is uh, chapter twenty nine done. Now. Next chapter, you have 30, and then that's just going to be how many pages? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay. So, again, there's going to be, like, two chapters that are literally, like, a page. So, um, yeah, I'm going to get, like, comfortable over here. Okay, this is better. All right. So, Peter stared. There had been a birch tree by the upper walls of the mill. He and his friends had named it the pirate tree because in the fall bright yellow leaves made it look made it look covered in gold coins. He tied packs to its trunk once when the kit hadn't liked their war play. The pirate tree was still standing, but now only blackened wisps tattered its branches. Nothing else except the mill itself was recognizable. All the trees in the, in the lower field were gone, uprooted and blasted into splintered logs. Great patches of grasses around them were scorched to ash. The bank was littered with crow-picked remains of perch and crayfish and turtles and frogs. What most hurt to look at was the water. The last time he'd been there, he dived into the pool at the base of the gorge. The water had been so sparkling and clear that he'd been able to see the pale green shafts of the reeds. The, the iridescent scales on the, on the trout and even when he looked up, the sheer blue nets of dragonfly wings skimming the surface. He might have been swimming through a liquid through liquid diamonds. Now muddy boulders clogged the river, and the and the pool was a dull brown ring. The broad flat of the river was half its usual bedeth. Mud flats near the banks, caking to dry clay, smelt smelled of death. The water was what the whole war was about. Peter remembered Vola asking him which side his father was on, was fighting on. Peter had answered her, stunned that she would, that she would even have to ask the right side. He added, indignantly, "Boy," Vola had said, and then "Boy" again to make sure she he, she had his attention. Do you think anyone in the history of this world ever sought out to fight some, to to fight for the wrong side? The wind picked up, and howled across the field, steering eddies of ash. Peter tried to imagine playing here again. It would be a long time before anyone would ever want to play here. Vultures, wheeling silently above him, were the only living things as far as he could see. With this much devastation, they must have been feasting for days. He watched them, paralyzed by the sadness of the scene. The closest two were circling a hemlock bow near the bank, probably just judging the safety of returning to the meal he had 
he had interrupted. A meal that might be pure, Peter. That might be. Peter couldn't form the thought, but he couldn't erase it either. If Pax had been here, he could only be dead now. And if he was, the vultures would lead him to the proof. They hovered over the three distinct spots, the one beside him and the two across the river. Slow and lazy, in no hurry, their meals weren't going anywhere. He dropped his pack, freed of the weight, he swung down to the hemlock bow in only a few steps. Trailing beneath it was the sight he was dreading, a fox trail, its white tip brush unmistakable. He lifted the limb. The frock's carcass had been scavenged, but its pelt remained, and it wasn't red. It wasn't red, not Pax. So I'm pretty sure he found gray, right? He took a ragged, he took a ragged breath, dizzy with relief. He pegged down to the river and wet and waded in. <sighs> when he was waist high, the crutches skidded out onto the mudslime stones. So he speared them over to the far bank and dived in. For the first time in almost two weeks, Peter didn't feel hampered by his broken foot. He swam strongly. He pulled himself onto the bank, out of the water. The soap cast felt like it weighed a hundred pounds. The muddy blast, the muddy plaster already crumbling. He took his knife out in his pocket and hacked it, and hacked at it until he freed his foot. It hung pale and limp, but the swelling was down and the bruise was almost gone. Peter crawled, up, crawled to his crutches and hitched them under his arms. Upright, he saw what the larger group of vultures was circling, the corpse of a deer. He thought of the doe he'd seen in, in Villa's field. You humans, you ruin everything, and turned away from the site. Twenty yards up the field, a single vulture hovered over the third spot he'd sighted. Peter climbing, choosing a path where the grass had been burned. Easier going. At first, there seemed to be nothing on the charred ground, but when he was almost upon it, he saw it, a hind leg, fleshless and sin and singed. But he still knew, but still he knew, knew it was a hind leg, a slim black furred hind leg with a small white paw. A ragged drift of fur at the top was bright cinnamon. Fox. Peter swayed onto his crutches. Maybe it wasn't Pax's. Wasn't it wasn't it too small to be Pax's? He wished he he could know. And then he took back the wish. What did it matter? Anyway, a fox had been going about its life here, and some humans had obliterated that life. Wasn't that enough of an outrage? He would scrape the earth with his bare hands and bury the remains. Peter dropped to the ground. He swept a circle bare of rubble, and his hand brushed something that turned the beneath and his lungs to ash. A toy soldier, sighting down the barrel of a rifle, pressed tight to its hard green cheek, aiming at whatever happened to be in the way. Peel no, peel, no, Peter kneeled over. Pax! Alright, that's chapter 30, and now we're going 31. And 31... Uh, it's like three pages, so. Yeah, pretty good. All right. Pax reached uh, the tree as the coyote sprang again, this time finding enough perches to hang from the branch. Pla Pax flew at him, and a bit a mouthful, and bit a mouthful of brindled fur and hung on. The coyote dropped and sank his teeth into Pax's sh shoulder. All in one motion, Pax jerked free and then backed toward the south edge of the clearing, hoping to lead the fox away from the tree, away from the den, away from the foxes he loved. The coyote didn't follow. He threw back his head and barked. Then he turned to eye bristle again. Pax lowered himself and began to creep back toward the tree. But then he stopped. He swung his head toward a sound from the from the encampment. His boy's voice? Ahead, the tall coyote barked again. And this time, the call was answered. The three sets of, the, of ears cocked at the same time spot in the juniper ring. A second coyote trotted out, another male, this one pale and stocky. He surveyed the scene and broke into a gallop for the tree. Bristle issued for issued another threat yell and spiked her fur. Pax saw her eyes roll in terror. The second coyote pawed at the trunk, and then his and then Pax heard it again, his boy calling his name. He bolted out of the clearing and threw the sand the stand of the trees of trees. At the ridge line above the mill he stopped. Worsick men Dreamed from the walls, sticks raised, converging on a figure down on the field. It was a black haired youth, curled on the bottom on the burned ground. His boy, the wind blowing from the from the north, told him nothing. The soldiers 
stopped. Their sticks were menace still menacing. The boy rose. He was tall, but Pax saw that his body didn't look like Peter's. This boy's shoulders were thrown wide, and braced under one was a narrow pole. Stranger still, this boy held his head high, not canned, not canted downward. He faced the men in defiance, something Pax had never seen Peter do, and raised his and raised his fist and shook it at them. A single shoulder ran toward, ran down the field. This one moved like his like his boy's father. He shouted and the fo and the voice was familiar. But then the man walked out, walked to the boy and embraced him. Something Pax had never seen the father do. Where were these his humans? Pax tried to scent, but the gusting breeze carried only the musk of enraged coyotes. He turned back for the clearing. And then that is chapter 31, and then chapter 32 is literally the page. Peter let his father hug him. For so many years, he had wanted to be in that circle of protective love. He felt his father quake with sobs, and he wanted to reassure him that everything was all right, but it wasn't. His hands stayed clenched, one on the, on the crunch grip, one onto the toy shoulder. He pulled away. What are you doing here? You told me that you would, that you would only be laying wire. And then he understood everything at once. Why the men hadn't advanced. How the grass of how the grasses has had been burned and the trees uprooted and the river strangled with rocks. How 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 there could be nothing left of a fox but a single leg. You knew. He shoved the toy shoulder into his pocket and picked up the fox leg. You knew and you did this. And then uh, that was the end of chapter 32. And then 33 is like a page. Uh, again, Pax thought he heard... Yeah, so this is 33. Again, Pax thought he had heard his boy's voice. He prickled his ears back to the camp. Just then, the wind shifted. Pax smelled the war-sick the war -sick sweat. Their cordite. Their motor, their motor fuel. Their charred fields. And his two humans. He ran back. To the ridge. He saw his boy lift something from the ground. A stick, but not a stick. Something furried and broken. The grief yearning scent rolled up the hill, fresh and keen from his boy, but also odd and strained from his boy's father. So this scent was not Peter's alone. It was the scent of humans. His boy felt the broken thing above his head and cried something angry. And then Pax! And Pax barked. That was chapter 33, and then this is 44, 44, I mean 34, and then 34. Is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, it's only 44. Oh my gosh, I read that completely wrong. Oh, it is PAX 5. It is PAX Bomb 5, right? No, I swear there's another chapter. Oh, wow, I got that wrong. I'm very sorry. All right, this is the last chapter. Woo! Yeah! Okay, chapter 34. Peter held what was left of the fox high above his head and called his name again. Pax! And from above the mill, an answering bark, hope rose in his throat. But no, he must have just wished for that bark. He scanned the ridge line anyway. A flash of red, a white tip brush, a fox appeared in the open spot and rose on its back legs, on two back legs, and looked straight at him. Peter pressed the fox leg into his father's hand. Bury this and then grabbed his other crutch and turned for the hill. Wait, Peter, you have to understand, it's my duty. Peter pointed to the fox on the ridge, thumped his chest so hard it hurt. That's mine. His father shouted to him about wires. He shouted at him to stop. Peter saw the wires. He pulled over them, but did not stop, because there was only, because there was only his fox waiting on the spine of the hill, and the distance between them, over and over, he planted his crutches and swung through, closing that distance. When he was almost there, the, his shirt dried from the wind and then soaked again in sweat. He stopped and called Pax, tossed his head, and then bounded away toward the trees. On four legs, Peter was sure of it. Pax was unharmed. Peter followed, but then again, just as he neared him, Pax broke away, galloping into the trees. Pax followed again. He didn't begrudge Pax. This, this testing game, he had broke... He had broken his pet's trust. Why wouldn't he be skittish? Why wouldn't he need to assure himself of Peter's loyalty now? For as long as Pax wanted, Peter would obey. It was it was fair punishment. Though the trees a hundred yards long and a hundred more, Peter followed, and then they broke into a clearing, and the fox stood and waited. Peter reached him. He offered his hand. 
I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Pax locked Peter's gaze and then took his wrist into the into his jaws. Peter's pulse jumped against the bracelet of teeth, pressed just tight enough to to claim him, just tight enough to call to Peter's own wildness. Two, but not two. Peter released Peter's wrist and tore across the clearing toward the crooked tree. Circling the tree was a pair of coyotes. Pax lunged at the taller one. No, Pax, come back! The tree was so far away, 50 yards at least. Peter dug his crutches into the turf and piked hard. When he was a dozen yards away, he saw the coyotes treed quarry. Another fox, she, um, another fox, bright furred with sharp, delicate face, a vixen. She was bleeding from a gash on her haunch, and instead of, th of a thick brush, she, she thrashed a blackened whip, whip of her tail. The vixen swiped at one of the coyotes from above, taunting him, and Pax snapped at the other's flank. Peter saw that the, that the two foxes were a team, and that they were no match for the coyotes. Peter barreled for the tree, shouting, but the coyotes ignored him. The taller of the two spun around and sank his teeth into Pax's neck. <gasps> no! Pax shrieked, and Peter roared in fury. He braced himself onto the crutch, on one crutch, and leaned back and side-armed the other, heavy with its white ash bat, as hard as he could, aiming between the two coyotes. Both of them wheeled around the, at the outrage. While the tree rang with the butt, with the bat's blow, the tall, dark one sprinted away and, disappoint, and disappeared into the brush. The other one bolted a dozen yards and then stopped and turned back. He eyed Peter and bared his fangs. Peter bared his teeth back. Pax growled at his side. Hackles raised, ready to spring. Pax, no, no, Peter swept his second crutch over his head and roared again. And Pax snarled, and the pale coyote reared back in surprise. He turned and crashed out of the clearing. Peter clutched the tree. He slid to the ground, shaking instantly. Pax was on, was on him, wriggling under his neck, licking his face, sniffing his broken foot, nuzzling his face again. Peter wrapped the, his arms around his fox and pressed his face to the piney, smelly, smelling fur. You're okay. You're okay. You're okay. The vixen leaped over, over them to the ground and disappeared into the juniper scrub, ringing the clearing. Pax set up and barked to, to her from Peter's lap. After a moment, Peter saw a, a black muzzle point out from the brush. Out came a skinny fox, about the uh, size Pax had been at eight months. Oh my gosh. Photo. 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 Look at that. This Pax. Look how adorable it is. Okay. Eight months. Blinking in the sunlight. And blinking in the sunlight. Guys, we're going to read this together. I know you can't see the words, but we're going to read this last chapter together. This last part. Uh, actually, no, that, that works. Doesn't work at all. Okay. <laughs> Eight months, blinking in the sunlight, he stumbled into the clearing on three legs. The vixen reemerged. She paced and yipped at the runty little fox, shooting worry looks at Peter. Pax squirmed out of Peter's arms and barked again. The three-legged fox took a few steps closer. Its limp was so awkward, Peter realized he must have lost a leg only recently. And then he made the connection. He offered his hand and called softly. Hasn't it? Hesing, hesent, hesitantly, 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 hesitant, hesitant, hesitantly, 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 his gaze darted between Peter and Pax. The little fox hobbed over. <sighs> uh, he tucked his head under Pax's chin. Peter extended a finger. The injured fox allowed him to brush his neck for an instant, then hurried back to the safety of the vixen's side. Together, two, the two foxes looked expectantly, expectantly at Pax, and then they melted in, into the underbrush. And Peter understood. His fox belonged to them, and they belonged to Pax. Inseparable. All this way he'd come. All this way. Peter got to his knees. He placed his hand on Pax's back and felt the muscles jump. Peter looked around. The woods looked dangerous now, full of coyotes and bears and soon humans at war. 
He looked down at his fox, fox still straining to follow his his new family. Go. It's okay. It wasn't, though. The pain scored him hollow, left him without breath, like a kick to the heart. Like a kick to the heart. He pulled his hand away because Pax would feel a pain that deep and he wouldn't leave. Go! Pax shot away toward the brush line. Then he turned back to look at his boy. Peter felt his tears roll down his face, but he didn't wipe them away. Pax sprang back. He whimpered, looking at the tears. Peter brushed. Peter pushed him down. He found the crutch and levered himself upright. No, I don't want you to stay. I'll always leave the poor store open, but you have to go. Pax looked toward the brush and then back at his boy's face. Peter dug into his pocket and pulled out the toy. He lifted it. Pax raised his head. His eyes trained on Peter's hand. And Peter hurled the plastic soldier over the brush and into the woods as far as he could. Sometimes the apple rolls very far from the tree. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Pax. Is that it? So that was the finale. Shit, I love that book so much. Oh my god. Yes. Yes! We're doing another book. Definitely. And I do want to say uh, Merry Christmas. Uh, tomorrow, well not tomorrow, uh, this upcoming Monday, we're going to uh, no, no, actually, tomorrow I gotta do a huge video for you guys that you're gonna absolutely love. Uh, later, I'm gonna be doing some Sonic Forces. And until then, my name is Sean Langs, I'm Rosestone, and I will see you guys in the next book. And I hope you guys really enjoy the finale of PAX. Um, I'll actually just make this possible so you can actually see me. But, yeah. I hope you guys enjoyed. This is really amazing. Thank you for all the support in the PAX series. Uh, especially for the people who really just cared about doing it, just listening, uh, like, for an audiobook for homework or whatever. Um, but yeah, I really hope you just enjoyed the book. I'm, I'll be happy either way. Uh, but yeah, see you guys, um, for another book next year. Until then, my name is Sean, and I will see you guys later tonight with some Sanic Forces. Bye-bye!